Happy Friday and happy Vespers. I just want to welcome you all here tonight um, to the first Vespers of the quarter. Now, I'm sad to say that the beginning of 2021 is basically just where 2020 left off. We still have coronavirus and we still have political unrest and we still have protests. We still have a, a divided country. And that makes me sad. I know that as a kid, I really didn't realize that we were divided. But as I grow up, I see just this further and further separation of people. And then the coronavirus doesn't help because it keeps us physically separated. The one thing that I hope for, the one thing that I hold on to, the one promise I hold on to as a believer in Jesus Christ is that he has promised that there will come a day where we will no longer be here. This world is not my home. That is the song I know that rings in my heart. Is This world is not my home. Eventually, there will come a day where there's no more death, sorrow, crying, and pain. Eventually, there will be a day where we can eat together, play together, pray together, sing together, and we won't have to worry about division, politics, race, disease. I can't wait for that day. I want you to hold on to that hope. That as we start this new quarter of Vespers, as we start a new quarter of school, hold on to the hope that this world is not our home and this will not last forever. We will prevail because he has prevailed. Let me pray with you. Father, great is your faithfulness and great is your love. Lord, we ask that you remind us that you are victorious and there will come an end to all of this. We ask that the spirit of the Lord is upon us and that you use us as much as possible to be healing to a hurting world. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. I just wanna say welcome again. I also do wanna say one announcement that I have. I was actually told that Student Life has bought some snacks, some goodies for you guys to have after Vespers. So I don't know how they're going to do it. I was told by the deans that they're going to do this, so they'll probably divvy it out. You'll, you'll find those announcements as it comes along. But after Vespers, there will be snacks for you, and you can thank Student Life for that. All right, have a good Vespers and a happy Sabbath. Take care. Everybody say overflow. Jesus right now to overflow. Say overflow. overflow. 
in this place. Sing that one more time. Sing it out. Sing it out. Say overflow. Overflow. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way. In this place. Time say overflow.
Christ is risen. Come on, say, bow down before. Bow down before Him. For, for He is Lord. Come on, say, say hallelujah. Christ is risen. Come on, let's do that. Say, oh, what a Savior. the fragrance of spring every creature unique in a song that it sings all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them
Happy Friday, happy Vespers. I wanna welcome you to Vespers and I hope that you really do take these hours just to enjoy them. Hopefully somehow you can find community in these hours also. I wanna pray with you before we get started. Father, great is your faithfulness and great is your love. May the spirit of the Lord guide my words and guide hearts. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. So it was a historic week. We just had the inauguration of our 46th president, Joseph Biden. But this was different than it has been in the past. First, one difference is that we have our first female president, or vice president, sorry, we have our first female vice president. But secondly, and more sadly, we had, everybody had to wear masks. People couldn't celebrate the same way. You didn't see the same hugs, the same uh, celebration. There was about a tenth of the people that normally are there, maybe even less than that. And also, we had higher security than ever before. Now, what overshadowed this and what was leading up for the last two weeks, why the security was so beefed up, was that on January 6th, what started off as peaceful protests, sort of the heart of what happened earlier this week, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, what his, uh, what his legacy represented or part of it was the right to protest peacefully. But obviously that got out of control and then rioting happened where there was vandalism and where there was actually loss of life. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge is I actually somewhat understand the rioters. I'm not saying that they're right, and I will not excuse rioting, vandalism, whenever that happens. But I understand why they're doing what they're doing. Now, there's a few that just want to burn things down. So I'm not excusing that at all. I'm not, I don't even understand that, why you would want to just burn things down. But I'm talking about the people that are just frustrated. They're acting out of frustration. And they're frustrated and they say, I can't trust you. I can't trust the government to do what they're supposed to do. Whether they're right or wrong, that's what they're saying. And they're saying it loud and they're saying it through their actions. We actually even saw that this summer when they were protesting, when some people were protesting something totally different. When they were peacefully protesting, there were a few that got out of control. And that same frustration is, I'm frustrated because I can't trust that you will take my rights seriously. I can't trust you. So all of this is because of a lack of trust. Now, I'm going to segue a little bit into where I think it's sad and where there's danger, especially to Christians, to Christians that go beyond the right and actually probably the the need for peaceful protest, the need to speak up for those who are oppressed. I'm going to say for those who go beyond that, from the Christian realm, it's not, a just, it's not just that we don't trust our government, but sad to say we lost trust in God to take care of it. We've lost trust in God. And God says, I will rise up. And you notice in Daniel, there's, there comes a point in time where it seems like we're, we don't know where God is. That's Daniel and Revelation. And eventually Michael rises up and he says, I will judge. I will judge. I know it seems like you're losing trust, but I will judge. Now, here's the thing. In our minds, we think of judges as people that sit in robes, that do trials, that 
uh, will either acquit people or condemn them. But that's not the biblical Hebraic word for judge. The word shafat, where the word sheftim comes from, if you know the book of Judges, that's sheftim, that's plural of shafat. It literally means to deliver, to set free, to, to deliver those who are oppressed. And, and you find this out that when you look at the judges of the Old Testament, you've got Samson, you've got Gideon, Deborah, Jephthah. They were always there to deliver the oppressed Israelites. These other nations were trying to enslave them just like Egypt had done. And God says, I want you to have judges to help you keep your freedom, to deliver you. You can trust them, but, but more than that, you can trust me. And eventually Michael will rise up saying, trust me. Don't try to do this on your own. Actually, the Romans talks about trying to do it on your own. And maybe speaking to what happened on January 6th about the, the, the challenges of going out of control, going overboard and rioting the way that it happened. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And that doesn't just say in the eyes of Christians. It says, be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. I wish they would have read this right before that. I wish they would read this before anybody goes the next step from going from protest to rioting. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, and, and it's key. On the contrary, it's saying this is the way God really wants you to do it. And this is the way he would do it. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I know it's hard to trust. And sometimes it doesn't look like God is speaking loud enough. It doesn't seem like God is doing enough. But he's saying, I will take care of you. I do care about your rights. I do care about your well-being. But guess what? The world doesn't. And that's the, that's the challenge, I think, at times. And that's why we're led to protesting peacefully is because we're expecting the world, we're expecting our government, we're expecting them to be righteous judges. But there is only one righteous judge, and it's God. Now, I do want to delve into this just a little bit, because God is expecting you to, ju to trust him as your, as your judge. He's saying, I am your deliverer. I am your judge. My main purpose is not to condemn, but to deliver. Trust me. Obviously, we, we see through Scripture, there are people that trust and, and use the language of the Old Testament, the, shaf, the shafat that says the deliverer. Because David even says, judge me, O Lord. If it meant condemnation, he would not say, judge me. But he's saying, deliver me, Lord. Judge me. I trust you. I trust you to stand in my corner. I trust you that when I am oppressed and all the world is against me, you will deliver me. That's what it means that God is our judge. Now, I do want to talk about another thing that has to deal with the judge, and that's judgment. Just like at times we as believers have not trusted God and we've tried to take things in our own hands with vengeance, revenge, with rioting even. We as believers have done that. Also, we have misinterpreted the judgment as Christians. 
I want you to grasp this because this is actually gospel. You heard me. This is gospel. This is good news about judgment. I would, I would, as you claim this, hopefully you understand that this is the gospel of judgment. This is good news here. So, and I'm speaking a little bit as, as my bias as a Seventh-day Adventist, because I am Seventh-day Adventist. And our bias is that this whole great controversy theme, if you've ever heard that before, this great controversy is really the essence of it is about God's character is being attacked by the enemy. The enemy says he is not fair. He is not loving. He plays favorites. He doesn't really care about you. He only cares about his reputation. That's it. You're just a pawn. And God has to defend his character through love, through loving actions, through becoming vulnerable. So here's, here it is. So, so we have this thing. We even uh, have a, a portion that's called the investigative judgment. Now, I don't know what you believe in that, and you can talk to your scholars, your theology department about this, about what they believe about the investigative judgment. But here it is. Here's the real essence. I want, I'm going to strip it down to right here, the gospel of the judgment. So if God was really God, which I believe he is, if he's really God and he's really sovereign, he could easily say this. All right, you're in, you're out. You're in, you're out. Uh, you're in, you're out. You're in, you're out. And he doesn't have to explain anything. Just people that are in, people that are out. He's God. He can do that. And we should trust him. But instead, he does this with the judgment. What it says in Revelation 20, it says that during the judgment, the books will be open and we will be judged according to every deed we do. Now that could be scary because I've done some bad deeds and I've hurt some people on the way. And I'm assuming I'm not the only one on this campus that's done things that have hurt other people or hurt God. So it's scary that he would judge every single thing, that this would be laid out for everybody to see. And that could be embarrassing too. But it's something he needs to do. The judgment needs to happen. Because there might come a point in time where I see that my grandma didn't make it, but I thought she was a good person and I love her. But I notice that this serial killer does make it. And I say, in the back of my head, God, did you really make that decision? Did you really make the decision to bring that person in and my grandmother is not in? So that question, that seed of doubt is there. And maybe that's not just with me because other people are having that same question. That seed of doubt, seed of doubt. Seed of doubt is there. So again, the, the, the question comes up, can I trust you, God? So a thousand years into eternity or 10,000 years, that little seed is growing a little bit. Can I trust you, God? Can I trust you? I don't know. So before we get to that point, God says, I want you to check everything. I want you to make an educated choice if you want to follow me or not. I want you to know everything that happened, where the decisions were made, where people accepted Christ, where people rejected Christ, where people were just trying to earn their way to heaven. I want you to see everything. Now, here's the crazy thing. Here's the point of this, why it's gospel, is none of this has to do with you, specifically about judgment. You are not on trial. God already knows. You aren't on trial during the judgment. I'm going to say that again. You are not on trial during the judgment. Gospel. There is only one on trial, and that is God himself. 
he actually puts his character on the line, himself on trial during this time so that we can choose and we can answer the question, do I trust you? Are you fair? Are you really loving? Are you compassionate? Are you fair? That is the question. Are you fair? Because when we get into eternity, there cannot be any questions. And that was the heart of the great controversy. But this is gospel. That God puts his reputation on the line. He doesn't care about his rights. He's not going to protest or riot he lays himself on the line. That's gospel. So to wrap it up with judgment, judgment is good news. First thing, because God as our judge, all he wants to do is find any way possible to deliver us. Any way possible not to condemn Actually, John 3.17 says that, this, that Jesus came, that the, the Son of God came to save us, not to condemn us. His purpose is to save. And secondly, the judgment is so that we can know without a doubt that we can trust God and his judgment. That we can trust him. I hope this was gospel to you because this message is gospel to me. I hope you have a great Friday, a great weekend, and again, enjoy these hours and bask in the freedom that God is not going to judge to condemn you. He wants to deliver and save and for you to trust him. Have a great weekend.